All right, everyone, if you can take your seat, we're going to get started. I love the lentil soup so much, there's some in my glasses, so if I'm not looking at you directly, that's why. <laughs> For this, um, let me see what... For this next session, uh, we will have a little bit of time at the end for questions. So you can use Slido during the, the four demonstrations that will take place. Um, and then at the end of the, when we have a few minutes, we'll post them up and then we can see both what has been asked and then uh, pick a couple depending on the time that we have to be, um, uh, to be selecting. Because the topic of this uh, session is culinary creativity in the plan forward kitchen but the second part of the title is financial viability in the plan forward kitchen which is always a big question and and that's something extremely impor important in terms of messaging to customers right that um they really don't mind spending 50 60 70 80 bucks on a steak right but how do you make people understand that a, a, a plan forward or even just a plant-based dish is worth 20 30 dollars because of the labor because of the cost of the ingredients, etc. Um, so that's some of the things we'll be talking about through this session as we're also um, uh, watching wonderful demos of extremely creative dishes and uh, talking with chefs who have been um, able to make it work and of course some of the challenges that they still have. So um, how many of you have had a cauliflower steak in the last year, two years? All right, so pretty much everyone. Um, the person who probably started the cauliflower steak trend, I don't love to use that word, um, but is our first presenter in this session, Rick Lopez. Um, he presented at Latin Flavors in San Antonio about six years ago, and he did a cauliflower steak, and the room gasped because six years ago you had never seen a cauliflower steak. So um, Rick is the executive chef at La Condesa in San Antonio. He is, um, uh, he worked for a long time at Cafe Boulou in New York um, uh, and uh, under future James Seward Rising star chef Gavin Kaysen. He also worked at, under Terrence Brennan at Pichelin and Ed Brown at 81 on the Upper West Side and Ed is here, is that correct? All right, um, so that's a lovely full cycle kind of thing. Uh, Rick returned to Texas in 2009, where he worked uh, uh, with uh, Café Boulou alum Sean Creek Circle, um, and then worked under Rene, Chef Ronnie Ortiz at the uh, award, Beard Award-nominated La Condesa. After his first year, he was promoted to Chef de Cuisine, and since August 2013, he has been the executive chef. Rick Lopez. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be amongst all these uh, culinary minds and whatnot. And, you know, it's funny that we talk about um, this cauliflower steak still. It's, it's something that's a part of me and has been, even when I was working in New York, we, we made this cauliflower steak, but we only sold about two, maybe three a night for vegetarian or vegans or really health conscious guests and diners. And to me, I wanted to make it something that's uh, presentable also for meat eaters and our carnivorous tendencies. And it's something that we do at the restaurant, and I think we do it well. We add chilies to it. You'll see a little bit of that demonstration here throughout this panel this morning. But, uh, you know, when we talk about the, the culinary creativity and the financial viability in a plant-forward kitchen, it's something that has kind of, uh, to me now, stuck to who I am as a person and what we do in La Condesa for our guests. And we do have uh, modern Mexican cuisine and culture. And what that means to me initially when I started taking over uh, La Condesa was that the culture itself and the cuisine was always lent to vegetables. It was always lent to chilies and herbs. And if you had a piece of pork or meat or fish, that was almost just a luxury at that point. And you're living a really good life at that, at that juncture. So we think about vegetables in, in ways that not a lot of people really do yet, but it, it'll be part of us very, very soon. Um, I always say the joke in the kitchen is that we want to treat this vegetable like a piece of meat. And it's always like, yeah, I, I've been treated like a piece of meat and I'm not being treated well. But when you think about what you get in your kitchens and how you treat your proteins, your fish, your pork, your meat, you are treating that with care. And chances are the kid who's been working with you for about a week, you're not even going to let him look at that. You're like, get over there, peel the potatoes, do the asparagus again, or make that stock. The way we treat it in the kitchen is like gold. And I say it all the time. Um, it's one of those things that means a little bit more to me 
coming from, you know, in my background where my mother was a migrant worker, so she picked all of the cotton and all the watermelons and the squash. So a, a little bit of that was, um, I guess, forced into our DNA when we were kids. And cleaning the room was just one of those things that had to get done. And if we didn't eat all the vegetables, don't worry, you'll have a second chance the next meal you're going to get. Didn't eat the second time, don't worry, you'll have a third chance. Um, and it was always kind of a funny thing to me. I was like, I don't think I need these. I don't, I don't understand it. Um, you know, trying to help people understand the vegetables and what they're worth is also understanding the farm game. And I say that with, you know, kind of a smile in my voice because I spoke to our farmer this morning back in Austin, Texas, and his name is Sean Fagan, and he lives in a little town called Kyle, which is about 35 minutes drive from where he's at to the city in Austin. And the, the farm game to him is always staying fit, right? Because it's a game. And when we stay fit, we're communicating. And yesterday when we opened up, we talked about the powerful tool of our tongue, and then the powerful, the second powerful tool in the kitchen was communication. How do we open up? Sure, we're going to taste things, we're going to enjoy some things, but how do we get across the point that what we're serving you right now, what we're bringing into your kitchen right now took uh, a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, and then it also uh, shows you that the time and effort that does go into it isn't as, um, I guess, glamorous or as short of period that we think. You know, I was talking to Sean this morning about radishes, which we're going to do here. These breakfast radishes that he does for us is a, the shortest window that we can... This is like 30 or 35 days from seed to harvest. And I'll talk about that throughout cooking here as well. Um, seed to harvest, to me, is the entire process. When something walks into the kitchen from any of our farmers, any of our purveyors that are local, responsibly and sustainably producing for us, we have to show those cooks directly that this person right here and his wife took time to be farmers, one, which is not very glamorous, and then two, to also bring it to us and, and show it to us in a really great light that we wouldn't think otherwise. Um, you know, respecting the product and respecting that whole process goes into what we teach into the kitchen. We're going to show a dish here that, you know, it speaks to the way we want to work. So we've done this, we've heard these terms of like nose to tail and then root to, you know, tops and everything. The seed to harvest is really the most important thing to me because it tells a story. Uh, it tells a story of all the hard work. All the, uh, all the times where you didn't know if the weather was going to cooperate with you. And then you get these things like these little radishes, right? And I love radishes. We get, I think Sean was telling me today, we get out of 10 restaurants in Austin, we get about 80% of the radishes. And it's just one of those things that goes back to when I was eating dinner with my father. Um, he would always eat a Serrano, bite into it like an apple, and then dip the salt in there. And he would say, it just takes the spice away. So yeah, an eight-year-old kid's going to do what his dad does, right? So he do the salt thing. It's just like, no, it didn't. Like, it didn't do anything for me. <laughs> he would do the same thing with radish. And we would have raw radish a lot. And I, I didn't even really think about that until I started cooking them a lot. And I would tell my dad, oh, I got these radishes. He's like, oh, great. You just, do you just eat them? You just put them on the plate? And I was like, no, we, we use lots of butter because it's healthy for you. And we do lots of like things with creme fraiche and salsa. And he's like, oh, I never would have thought of that. But uh, it, it's something that's really cool for the dish wise speaking. Um, I'll cook a little bit so we can just kind of hear the sound of what it's going to be like. And I have some already cooked off, and I'll warm through, and we'll go through with all that. But uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight, too, is when we play this farm game, you know, Sean was talking about it really heavily this morning, that um, it's not always fun or easy or cheap or quick or fair. When he said fair, it's just like it breaks your heart. It's not fair. You don't know when it's going to rain super hard. You don't know when it's going to freeze super hard. The line in Austin is, if you don't like the weather, just wait 30 minutes. You can get all seasons within that time frame. It can be super hot. At night, it'll be 40 degrees. Tomorrow, it's going to rain and hail. And we got snow last year in central Texas. It's a real thing, and it's not fun for Texans to drive in snow because we don't know what we're doing. Um, so we have these radishes here. And also, you know, we're talking about, can you guys hear that a little bit? That's what I always tell the cooks. We always want to hear it tell us that it's okay. So we've got hot pan. We've got some greens attached to it. Um, I look at this dish right here with, with love and care. About, I think, four years ago, we went to uh, Mission Chinese in San Francisco, and there was this dish with, I, I believe it was pork jowls and radish. And I was like, let's just order that. He kept the tops on, kept the radishes whole. The pork jowl was in there. It was delicious. The sauce was sticky. The fermented beans were amazing. All that good stuff. But when I eat these radishes, it just, I don't know, it made me kind of smile inside because somebody was showing 
um, the versatility of a vegetable at that point, but also mixing it with meat, which is kind of, you know, where we're going to go today in, in all of our talks and maybe throughout this whole weekend here. But for us, trying to pair and trying to be creative and trying to stay within uh, profit margins, which we sometimes don't like to hear chefs all the time. It's like, where are we sitting? What's the food cost? Let's sit down and do the P&L. Those aren't always the most fun things, but since we're here and we're talking about it, we can go over the pricing. We can go over what we pay for uh, beef cheeks and hanger. And for us in Texas, you know, we have examples of beef cheek, which is something that's all over the menus now, and it's the little piece that nobody really wants to mess with, and it's delicious when it's braised, and you cover it in mole, and you're, you're set with tortillas. Beef cheeks are three twenty five a pound. Hanger steaks can go from twelve ninety nine a pound, maybe cheaper, hopefully. Things like redfish are five sixty nine a pound. And then you get into these radishes. And radishes normally come in bunches for us through the farms. And that's six to seven to maybe eight or nine radishes. Whatever that bunch is, it's market price, right? Fagan radishes are Sean Fagan in Kyle, Texas. That's three fifty nine a bunch. So equivalent to a pound or so. And then his uh, breakfast radishes that he does here as well, two fifty a bunch. When we're looking at that in the kitchen, when I have the chefs bring everything in, we're looking at, okay, what are we going to do with all these radishes? We use it all. We use it all, and we'll talk about it here. If you can see these radishes that are here on the, next to the board, we've glazed them whole. The tops are cooked like if you were to braise greens with like ham hock and onions and garlic and all that stuff. But it's purely cooked in butter, and we'll probably cringe a little bit because it's a lot of butter. It's like, I believe for this, this was about a half a pound of butter. But it's delicious. <laughs> so just hang out with me here. We were, I remember cooking in New York, and uh, I was on Entremet, and you glaze all your vegetables. French kitchen, you glaze all your vegetables. Everything's glazed to the T, perfectly. Butter. And I remember there was this new pastry girl, and she's looking around the corner. She's like, okay. I see what you did with those carrots. And I was like, oh, man, I messed up again. What? What? Tell me, hurry, before chef sees. She's like, you put all that butter. That's why they taste so good. I was like, we oui, chef. Goes to the window. People eat it, right? It's a good thing. We're utilizing everything. We're, we're trying to be no waste at this point right here. I'll warm these through, and then I'll talk a little bit about the salsa, too. The salsa that we use incorporates the radish tops. So we've taken some of the radishes, cleaned some of those tops that are a little bit crispy for us. And then we even have some of these beautiful radish shavings, which will serve for a garnish. And to me, really add that really crisp, watery, uh, kind of element to your dish right there. You're going to get fat, plenty of it. You're going to get salsa and acidity. And then something to always kind of cleanse it that I always look at is like that pickled ginger when you're eating sushi. This is what that radish does, and I love it. It's on tacos. It's on salads. It's uh, by itself with a little bit of butter at the restaurant for happy hour menus. We have chile de arbol. So that's the spice. Like my grandma would say, this is the pica. This is the, the fire in the dish right there because we're fusing basically what we've learned in our kitchen techniques as butter and radishes, using some creme fraiche, and then trying to meld different techniques and cultures and ideas all in one dish right there. To me, that's really fun. It's very exciting, and it helps me kind of get the story across to what we're trying to do at La Condesa, where it's very modern, modern Mexican. I'm not Mexican. I'm Chicano, but I know the culture because when we ate food in the family, we just called it food. The friends would come over like, oh, we're having Mexican food. And I was like, yeah, yes, yes, we are. It was every day. It was every day for us. So that was kind of cool, you know. Uh, but also going through, you know, all of my trainings and what the techniques were, what the techniques were for French versus uh, Mexican. Yes, very different, uh, very vast in the way of each uh, culinary respect. But when you break it all down, to me, and you boil it all down, and I love these stories. It's just really the same. The, the, the story that we're trying to tell as chefs and people within the industry and then the culinarians that we have, we just want to do really good food. We need to be creative at this point because, you know, we've almost, we've almost seen it all. And I feel like these dishes, when you're talking vegetable forward or plant forward, really speak a really good tone versus a nice beef dish. One of my favorite things to do at uh, events when we're out you know, away from the restaurant is we do vegan things and we char them and we burn the hell out of them and we add really spicy things and really acidic things to them. And in Texas, people love their beef. We're cowboys, right? We ride horses all the time, shoot guns. 
when I can get that cowboy Bob to eat a piece of cauliflower or radish and him ask me, there's no meat in it? No, sir, I just tricked you into eating a vegetable. That to us is really exciting. <laughs> it's the most insane thing because they're just like, okay, okay, fair enough. You know, you get that kind of reaction. Um, and, and tying it all back into, you know, the viability and how we treat it, you have to go back to thinking, what are we going to do when we get this piece of beef cheek, this piece of hanger, versus us trying to get better within our, within our own realms, whatever we do professionally. How do we get locally sourced product or sustainably sourced or responsibly sourced? It's really up to you on what words you want to use at that point. You know, uh, yesterday we opened up with, did farm to table jump the shark? You know, those are one of those deep conversations that you have with your friends outside. To us at La Condesa, to me, to what we teach the chefs is uh, responsibility because you can be sustainable, you can, but if you're going out and buying everything from Fagan and Miss Dorsey and leaving nothing for anyone else, you're not being responsible. Therefore, you're just doing yourself a disservice in what you're trying to be uh, for a sustainable chef or sustainable kitchen. And I strongly believe that. We like to share. If we're gonna get some radishes, oh, I've got 25 pounds and that's all I got. Well, then I'll just get like 10 pounds. I'll get the 15, we'll source it from somebody else. But the point is, uh, you have to be responsible on who you work with. Your farmers are the direct middle, there, there is no middleman, they're the direct contact, so you cut everything out. If you're buying from a big corporation where it is uh, locally sourced or farm to table, chances are you're gonna pay a little bit more for that premium of somebody sourcing already from you don't know where versus Sean coming in or Katie, or Dorsey, or Joe with the microgreens. This is everyday life for us at the restaurant too, and to, to shine a little light on that one too, we're a high volume restaurant in the middle of downtown, right next to Austin City Limits. So all the PBS shows you used to watch back in the day with Willie Nelson, we're right behind there. So for us, that means 200 people on a show night. So that's pre-theater for my New York days right there. It's like when I worked in the Lincoln Center, if you had a show, there was 200 covers coming, no matter what, be ready, God bless you, you know? Same thing happens in Austin. And when we play this farm game, I want to show people that we care, for one. I want to show people that we're here. And then I want to show people that we're going to stay relevant for as long as possible because the way we're trending at this point, um, as, as who we eat as consumers and diners and what we do in our kitchens, we owe ourselves a little bit more to what we're providing for nourishment and whatnot. And then we also owe the guests that are coming in because they're just more knowledgeable at this point. Um, you know, I'm 38 now, and people that are younger than me really are into what they're eating. And when I was 20, I didn't really care. I was like, I just got to get fed somehow, some way. Growing up, coming back to my roots, thinking about what, what I learned as a child, you know, okay, we have to be a little bit more responsible. When you tie all that back into what your financial uh, stability is going to be, you want to think a little bit more along the lines of, yes, is this dish going to be $8, or is this dish worthy of it being $16 or $17? The answer is it's worth it. It is worth it. When you start making these smaller connections, wherever you are, and seeing directly who is providing for you, you really understand that the hands have picked these radishes, tomatoes, greens, whatever. And you understand that all this went into the ground five or six months ago. And then you understand when this rainstorm is coming or hailstorm is coming, either buy the product or you're not going to get any product. If there's too much of something, uh, chilies are going to be a thing here in the next I guess month and a half or so, if there's too much chilies and the farmer's like, I'm just bursting, buy the chilies. What do you have? You have pickles, you have fermentation, all the stuff that we like to talk about and uh, preserve. It's the game that you have to play and it's that farm game that I always talk about and, you know, going back to that staying fit, which is the communication. I do a lot of sports analogies because I played soccer and in my dream world I would have been either better than Messi or Ronaldo if you guys know who those, those guys are over there. But uh, it's cooking that, that took me to new heights. So I'm going to go into the dish right now, too. Um, normally, all this stuff, you know, you can do it by hand for your home. You can do it in a robo coop, but it's just raw. It's crudo. Everything is raw at this point. So you've got your radish tops. You've got a little bit of toasted arbol, fresh serrano, some tomatillo, garlic, and then we'll do a little vinegar at the end, too. And what it turns out to look like is something like a chimichurri or something like a pesto, but it's very green. It's very bright. It's vibrant. It's going to help these radishes that are coated in butter speak a little bit louder. When we coat these radishes, we add a little bit of red wine vinegar and lemon to it also. So you're not just full on eating like radish and butter at that point. Um, 
We have a little creme fraiche that we also make in the house too. So it's been lightly whipped. So this is gonna be like our, our fat. So when you're thinking of like a dish like this, this is something for like a little piece of bread or toast or lavash or like something crunchy that you can kind of scoop up into there. When we look at the sauce here, we know we've got everything that we've utilized. So there's tons of radish in there. There's the radish that's been cooked here. There's raw and then there's crisp. I'm always trying to think of the different textures, ways and uses. Um, when I was working in New York, I noticed that when we were doing meat dishes, everything was used. If a whole animal was coming in, use it all from stock to the pate to the bone broth, to whatever was gonna happen, chef needed you to use it all. And I take that um, very seriously with the, the roots and whatnot. This salsa will just be right in the center. And then we have our cool looking little radishes with the tops on them. And if you haven't had these, I mean, they're pretty prevalent. They're, they're on a lot of different menus at this point, but if you haven't had them like this, I believe we're gonna do some tonight. And the greens are delicious. Like if you grew up in the South and you had those braised greens, you're getting that bite. If you know what a radish is and you like it, you're getting that bite. And then at this point we go back into, I don't know, I always try to think about it as like it in its raw form when you're creating like a, like a dish or a piece of art. So we have the cooked, we have some spiciness, some elements to it. We use a little bit more of these tops that are really nice and bitter and crunchy. And then we'll use these, um, the beautiful shaved, which the chefs love me for. How many do we need? We need like 12 quarts. If you haven't shaved 12 quarts of radishes, <laughs> it's life changing and cathartic and all of it at once. That's how they see it, of course, right? That's how they see it, of course. <laughs> and all in a time crunch too. And then you have textures and you have some fun. And when you look at it, you're not seeing, at least to me, you're not seeing a seven or eight dollar dish. You're seeing something that could be a little bit more elevated. And then you have that story to back it up as well. And it's also just very delicious. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Rick. So what, is the, what, is the, what does this go for on your menu? So this is not on the menu yet, but we're looking at so if we're looking at these for, you know, three fifty nine. This is something that can go for us for like almost a ceviche price. And ceviches in, in our restaurant range from fourteen dollars to seventeen dollars. And I would do this at a sixteen dollar price right here, oh. flat out. And it would be very, I, I think, satisfying to a guest also. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's key, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's hard to talk about the next presenter without sounding extremely privileged. Um, but uh, I first met Joaquin Cardoso when I was uh, uh, through when he was working with Enrique Alvera, with whom we've worked a lot. Um, and Joaquin was his uh, chef de cuisine, his corporate chef after having spent a lot of time working in France for Jean-François Piège at the Crillon, at the Chateau Briand, um, so on. You know, three Michelin star restaurant, world 50 best restaurant. Um, and then I had heard that he had left Enrique's group and opened something in Mexico City. And last year I was there and I was working. Um, and so I ordered food from my hotel while I was working on the, on the hotel's terrace. And it was a purslane salad and a beet salad, I think. And those dishes were so good. It was something I was, you know, almost mindlessly eating while working. And then suddenly I stopped and I was like, my God, this is amazing. Both of these dishes are so amazing, so satisfying, so healthy, so flavorful, so redolent of spring um, and then a little bit later I walked I was walking back to my room passed by the kitchen and there was Joaquin cooking and that was his new kitchen one of his new kitchen he's now in charge of seven restaurants between Mexico City um, uh, Guadalajara and Merida um, he owns a wine bar also a natural wine bar in Mexico City um, his food is extremely uh, it's rooted in his uh, Mexican-ness it's Mexican ingredients um, but it's also very different from what you might think of as traditional Mexican food, and it's very um, produce forward, um, and it's just really, really wonderful, satisfying food. Um, and so it's really my great pleasure to uh, introduce you guys, if you don't know him yet, Joaquin Cardoso, and hear his take on Mexican food. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for that introduction. I won't expect that. <laughs> well, 
Thank you for inviting me among some of the best chefs and professionals. I am Joaquin Cardoso, and I have the responsibility and the fortune to be behind seven restaurants across Mexico. All of them are very vegetable forward. That has given us a fuss between vegetarians, even if we don't sail by that flag. I mean, that just came like that. I enjoy it, and I'm thinking probably for the next project. When we opened Hotel Carlota five years ago, vegetables were the first thing we sourced. We found our closest friend and producer, called Jolkan, to be in the same city, one of the biggest cities in the world, in Xochimilco, which is a protected area. You can see how they harvest over there. And it's been an, an agricultural hub from the time of the Aztecs. We've been working for them for a long time and have a close communication of what's available and how to treat the product. Uh, it's a very unique way of harvesting that we can probably write a whole book about it. No, so we won't go to details. But we wanted to be our menu composed with a very heavily vegetable side. And that was very hard five years ago for a hotel menu in Mexico City were probably the only vegetable item that you could find was guacamole. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that happened to you. Maybe some of chefs can relate to that story with me. But as time goes by, I enjoyed more and more to cook with vegetables and work with them. I was trained in France and in culinary institutes, we were trained to master butcher fish and meat. That was the highlights. Like, you start with vegetables, you learn how to cut them, you learn how to cook them. But for me, it was like super precise techniques. We even go like sous vide, slow cooking. But vegetables were very limited, I think. Like, for me, it was tomato, confit, sauce espanol say soup probably and they were more recipes they were no techniques so you apply recipes to vegetables I hope this has been changed because it's been a while since I'm done with school but as time goes by I learned like this Spanish new wave that treat vegetables differently and that was appealing already in my mind you know? So I enjoy more to cook because when you give a tomato some imagination, you can do a foam, a sorbet, a jelly, and powder, you know, even take a cheese grater, grater and do a beautiful vinaigrette for a muscle salad. Or so this takes me to try to imagine vegetables as techniques. And these two examples of what I bring today is how we managed to sell in Mexico, which has very similar way of thinking as in Texas. Of you go to a restaurant, you go order meat, you know, and that's easy. If you do a super well roasted ribeye, everybody will love it, right? But vegetables, you have to give an extra effort, an extra twist on the menu. So we bring, for example, this cooked cauliflower that we give the idea of a barbacoa. Barbacoa is a traditional dish that's cooked underground in between leaves. It depends on the region, like north of Mexico, we usually use beef. In the, south, in the middle, we use lamb. And in Yucatan, by example, this technique is called peeb, and we use different leaves, like tropical fruit leaves and banana leaves. And we cook pork and pull, uh, turkey. So we took this idea as a technique and we start cooking vegetables like this, like eggplants, cauliflower. And we decided to take our version of this cauliflower steak that was very fashionable here in the US, USA and Europe and this way of cooking of Nordic things, of translating. And that's how we start selling this item. It has become one of the best selling items in the menu now. And for us, 
vegetable is still quite achievable, especially the like common vegetables. If we go to parsley or salsify, that could be expensive, but still, it's not like my friend Rick said. So for us, this is a very good thing on the menu. We can price it, uh, for us it's like 15 pesos cost, and we sell it like 160. But given the idea of this festive dish, the barbacoa style, nobody has complained. Nobody has to know. <laughs> so we can play with another more vegetables. The other dish I will present is tamal. Tamal is a very popular dish. Everybody eats it. It's a common, very common. You have even bicycles that sell it in the streets. And what we have done here is we have given a luxury twist. For me, like working in France for many years, like mushroom season was a celebration. So we have brought like mushroom rain season with a little trifle to a tamal. So it's a very common way of eating with an unexpected profile. So while I start preparing this, I had to trick it. So this is the cauliflower. So there is some guava leaves that you can smell that I can pass through you. So we cook it between the leaves, long time. They are there. And then we just roast it super. This is brown butter. I used a little bit of brown butter. But we can go vegan. We have done this vegan with olive oil or coconut oil. It's very good as well. I just like brown butter. So we're going to brown a little bit the cauliflower that has been cooked probably 45 well, to 55 minutes, very low. In Carlota we have a wood oven, so that recreates a little bit like the barbacoa filling. That's how we call it like that. Um, Then we change some greens, depending on the season. I like to use watercress because it has this extra kick and nasturtium leaves. And then we do like a sunflower seed puree. It's like kind of a praline. We toast it very lightly. We put some sea salt and we just blend it in the thermomix until it's super fine. That gives like a silky approach and to the cauliflower that I really like. react to the to the naming because barbacoa is something as you mentioned that is so um, traditional and and that people have such clear expectations over what it is and when you when they get cauliflower barbacoa do they expect something different than what they're getting or how do you handle that I think this has been a great acceptation like people understand that this cook there I don't even have like to show. Like, I thought at the beginning probably we should have to show it first and do like. People just when they eat it, they like it, and I mean, Carlota have as you know is not a very fine dining restaurant. It's a restaurant in a hotel. We do room service, so the service is super like in, on formal and yeah. quick. Um, yeah. I forgot this one. So we like to drip with this one. And then we do the salsa matcha. 
Salsa matcha is a sauce from Veracruz. It's very oily with comapeño chiles, garlic, and nuts. We do cashews, almonds, peanuts, and season. And my, my grandmother used to love it because she was, she was born in Cuba, but she lived in Veracruz almost all her life. And that's just how we do it. We put a lot of the salsa. Some nasturtium flowers just to make it look nice. Some sea salt. And that's it. play the tamal. So what we do is we have a special meal that makes heirloom corn masa. And we buy the masa. I'm looking forward to do my own one. It's a project we are looking for, for a new space that is completely Mexican. Because as Carlota, you know, it's not super Mexican. It's Mexican product with my history, I think. Like training France, like traveling, we take a lot of inspiration from another culture. And this tamal is a, an example of that. Like super French roasted mushroom puree. So we cook the, the tamal in the banana leaves. Steam it like from 45 minutes. So. And this is made like half masa, half mushroom, roasted puree, and a little bit of trifle. So we have a, the roasted mushroom puree that I really like. I'm gonna put this. Then we have some seasonal mushrooms. Usually in Mexico we can find por porcini, morels, lactarius, and of course quitlacoche that I really like. In this case here in California I use matsutakis, nokis, and porcinis. I didn't know really what's on season until I came here. And we dye some green chili, serrano, and onion. Just, this is pre-heated. Pre Liquid la coche. Is the tamal made with lard or butter? Or? Yes, we do, but okay. you can usually you, you can easily replace it. So this is another dish that could easily be made vegan. Be vegan, yes. Yeah. Do you get a lot of requests for vegan dishes? I do more and more. Okay. And since Mexico has been like a fashionary destiny now yeah. for Americans, we get more and more <laughs> vegan requests. I mean. I like it, really. <laughs> it's not a complaint. They are my best customers. I think <laughs> they really understand what we're doing. And and then we have this cheese that I really like. It's a cos Ocosingo cheese. It's a one of the three cheeses that really special in Mexico. The other ones are European style cheeses made there, but this one has a very unique way of doing dry in the jungle for like days. 
Ocosingo. Ocosingo is the name of the town in Chiapas. So it's a, like an AOC cheese. We have Cotija, Puerto de, de Ten, I think, in Tabasco. Uh, Cotija is Michoacan. Then we have another one in Tabasco that I forgot the name, and Ocosingo. These three are really special. Uh, it's a bit funky. What was the sauce that you put on that? It's a little bit more of mushroom puree. Okay, like just roasted. mushroom. Yeah, we use the trims and everything. Like, if, you know, porcini on season is very mushy sometimes. So we take all that mush and it's like very sleep, slimy. slimy. So that's perfect for the tamale. It brings like a very softly texture for it. So, so in that case, we don't waste anything. This is just some totomosle ashes, that's the corn husk burnt, and some green chilies for freshness. What is the price cost breakdown on, on this dish? But this one we can put like as well, probably with the trifle it would be like 20 pesos and we can sell it like 162. That's like 750 dollars around. We're still not very expensive. <laughs> Which is also why Americans love to come into your great right. <laughs> But yeah, but we have to play with our customers too. So this is just a nice cremini. We can have shavings of porcini or... Oh, let's see. Well, this is two examples of bringing something that is in the Mexican culture as a reference and turning into a vegetable dish. Thank you so much, Joaquin. Now you know when you guys have deadline why you should go and you know meet, meet them around a swimming pool eating Joaquin's food. Um, our we, have, we have guacamole too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, our next presenter is Ethan Mental, who is uh, one of the country's greatest caterers. Um, and it's not just me saying it, I can't reveal anything, I've been sworn to secrecy. But next week, should you find yourself in an airport perusing magazines, maybe peruse some of the business section magazines. That's all I'll say. Um, Ethan is a CIA grad, which was very, we we're very proud of him for that. Um, he, he was a class graduation speaker, winner of the Wine Spectator Award for Excellence. So from the very beginning of his education, he's always been at the very top. Um, and he's only continued to excel ever since. Um, He's worked at a number of five-star Relay and Chateau properties. Um, he worked in France under uh, Georges Blanc also, and um, where, where he became the first American to be offered a permanent paid position, and I'm sure a number of you uh, realize what a big thing that is. Um, he worked also under Thomas Keller and at Fleur de Lis under Hub Hubert Keller, and when he started Componere cat Catering in Emeryville, he brought a fresh restaurant-style approach to, um, to catering and assembled a world-class culinary team and also um, developed their own organic farm. So uh, I'm sure he'll mention that, but just in case, on his culinary team right now, for example, are two former um, uh, lead cooks at uh, French Laundry, former chef de cuisine at State Bird Provision also. So that's the caliber of chefs that he gets to attract in his um, business. And he's basically here in between a few enormous gigs. He regularly feeds 5,000 people the kind of food that he might have done at French Laundry um, or uh, with Hubert Keller. So it's a great honor to introduce Ethan Mental. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for that intro. I told these guys before me to do a really boring, bad job, but they didn't listen, unfortunately. <laughs> so I thought they were going to, I was hoping they'd make it easy for me. But um, excited to be with you here today. And um, those, there's some photos looping there. A few of them include some pictures from our farm. Are they rotating through? Or is it? No, okay, cool. Um, no, okay. Yeah, so just a few pictures. Um, as Ann mentioned, we have developed our own farm. 
and my wife runs it. It's not huge, a little over an acre, and we live on the property. It's uh, about 45 minutes north of San Francisco. I wasn't able to be here yesterday, but I understand there was, from Rick, I understand there was a discussion about whether farm to tables played out, that sort of thing. Um, and that is never a term that I've used for our food because to me, and I don't, hopefully I'm not repeating anything that was said yesterday, but all food pretty much comes from a farm. So I always found it to be somewhat of a funny term. I mean, unless it's something grown in a lab. But as we talk about how to charge more for plant forward cuisine, having our own farm has played a, a key role in that. And if you're not able to do something like that, because it is a, obviously a huge undertaking, um, I think it sounds like Rick has great partnerships with farms and obviously you've all heard a lot about that. But if you can take it a little bit to the next level, that has really helped us educate our clients. And we charge, like so for example, today I'm gonna be demoing a dish with sunchokes and beets, some uh, goat's milk yogurt with spring peas, and uh, pickled lime, sprouted lentils. We charge almost the same for a dish like this as we would for like our Wagyu tartare or something. So, and we don't have any pushback on that really, but what we do is um, we go into educating our clients about the preparation, certainly, and it's much more labor intensive to do a lot of this prep than dice a piece of Wagyu. Uh, although that, that raw product might cost more, this is much more labor intensive. So we talk our threat clients through that and we educate everyone that's dealing with our clients about that. And then we host parties at our farm in the garden. Um, we've had some clients, some corporate groups have even come and planted some things as a team building that we would then be harvesting for their event down the road. Those sorts of things. We post pictures on Instagram of different stages. See, like uh, Rick talked, I actually liked a lot of things Rick said about looking at the farm game. He called it a game. I thought that was really cool. I'd never thought of it that way. It, it is like a game and it's easy to lose often. Uh, when the weather's bad or you get some crazy beetle infestation or all different kinds of things like that. We share those stories with our clients. We don't hide that stuff. We're pretty upfront. And um, as they've kind of come to see all the work that goes into it, I think that really helps us with our pricing structure. Um, we have one client that we were harvesting some things for and I just took some pictures, emailed them to her uh, last year, and then she forwarded them to the executive team, one of the largest uh, tech companies in the world, because we were doing this 200-person uh, executive retreat. And she forwarded me the responses from them. She's like, this is why we pay for Comp and Air. Uh, and it was sort of pictures of us harvesting stuff leading up to their event, and the executives love it, and actually a couple of them, um, you know, billionaires, really well-known people, came up to me at the event and were talking about our garden and one said they wanted to come see it because they were putting one in, that sort of thing. So it is something that people appreciate it and it does add value. Um, I think you could get creative if you can't develop your own farm with um, maybe leasing a certain portion from a farmer and that's designated for you. It also drives a lot of our creativity, uh, seeing plants at different stages of growth, for example. Um, has been one thing that's been really cool. Uh, I'm gonna start warming a couple things up while I talk here. Um, so these, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a second, but I wanna just kinda start our dish here. Um, so these have been, uh, these are baby beets. Oh, that burner's uh, tripping out a little bit. Um, these are baby beets and sunchokes that have been that have been um, sous vide and ghee that has some gar garam masala spices in it. Uh, so we sous vide these uh, at 80 degrees Celsius for one hour until they're tender. And then um, once these are warmed up a little bit, we will, uh, we're gonna grill the sun chokes. Here. 
I guess we are. But... Um, so we're going to grill the sunchokes and kind of lightly, lightly char the peel. We don't peel them. Uh, we do soak them in cold water for a while and scrub them with a brush because gritty sunchokes are not fun. So that's uh, really important to get them good and clean. And then the baby beets, we're going to smash and kind of uh, sear in the cast iron skillet until they're crispy. So we get that going. And this dish was developed for a client of ours that uh, wanted a dish that felt very much of Northern California, but also reflected her Indian heritage. And we get a lot of requests like that. And then she was also gonna have a large number of vegetarian guests. So we wanted to do something that would appeal to vegetarians as well as non-vegetarians. So this is what we came up with. And it was a big hit and we've done it since and it's been quite popular. So these guys, as they warm up there, we are going to just give a little flatten. Kind of smash those down a little. And as that pan comes up to temp. Oh good, we're getting some heat there now. So, yes, yeah, so our farm not only produces vegetables, but uh, we have beehives as well. And we're gonna, there's some fermented honey on this dish today. So another area that um, really helps with adding value to vegetable forward dishes which has been spoken about at this conference, I'm sure, is our fermentation program. Um, really adds a lot of deep flavors and is another part of the story we can tell our clients when we're talking about vegetable forward dishes. This honey, um, so we do about 50% water, 50% honey, and then we've add, we added fennel to this. We've also done it with chilies, which is really good ferment at room temperature for about a month, and it gets a nice, uh, complex flavor. It kind of takes a little bit of the edge off the sweetness. And if any of you would like to try it afterwards, I can put some tasting spoons out. You're welcome to try it. It's pretty cool. Okay, so we're good here. So we are going to... Go ahead and start cooking these um, baby beets. So any kind, anytime we can have different textures, um, different textures on our dish, that is a plus. And we try to incorporate as many different things as we can. So we're going to have kind of a smoky flavor from the grilled sunchokes, and then we're going to base them with this uh, fermented fennel honey as they're almost done grilling. Uh, we want to obviously baste them at the end so, so the honey doesn't burn. All right. Just going to kind of get a couple of these on here. All right. So there we go. We just want to kind of lightly char these beets. We're going to char the, um, we're going to char the sun chokes as well. We don't have a spatula handy, so I'm just kind of, uh, there we go. <laughs> Weighing it with that. Okay. So, not getting a ton of 
teeth there, but that'll be good enough for the demo. All right. Um, the goat's milk yogurt, so we take some goat's milk yogurt, spring teas, sweated down green garlic, puree it all up. There, the goat's milk yogurt adds a nice tangy counterpoint uh, to the kind of the sweet beets. Um, and then there's lime pickle, which is a cool way to use trim. So this is the finished pickle here. Um, we've got some lime supremes. So we like to use a lot of citrus in our kitchen. Um, we're big fans of acidity. And we always use the byproduct from making those Supremes. Uh, lemons will do Moroccan style preserved lemons. This is more of an Indian style pickled lime. So after we make the Supremes, we take those, the, the leftover um, pith and peels and pickle it. Um, pickle masala, the Indian spice blend that we use for this right here, which I love. We use in a lot of other things now too. Um, is fantastic. So for these limes, we salt them for about two days. And you can do similar preparations with other citrus byproducts as well. Um, but lime's probably my favorite for this preparation. We salt them for two days, and then we cook them down with uh, sugar, vinegar, water. You can just salt them, it takes longer. So that's actually a slightly more authentic way to do it. If you wanna speed up the process a little bit, you can simmer it with some sugar and vinegar. Spices and pickle masala, which has the great cashmere chili in it. So these have been cooked down, started like this, ended up here. Um, lovely smell, goat's milk yogurt, that. The sprouted lentils, um, we also like sprouting things. And of course, we're in Northern California, so birthplace of hippies and all that stuff. Sprouting's rather popular. Um, sometimes we fry these, which taste fun, but they, they lose their nice little tails, and it doesn't look as sharp. So it depends. You also lose a lot of the nutritional value. Um, so it kind of depends which way you want to go there. Today, I think that we will um, not fry them. We'll keep them fresh. But if, if we do use them fresh, um, I feel like they definitely benefit from acidity. So we've got a little lemon vinaigrette. We'll toss them in. So we're just gonna go some goat's milk yogurt down on the plate. And we're going to go with a couple of these beets. Again, skin on. Just washed because that skin, skin crisps up. All right. Then take these guys here. Um, do you have a brush? Thank you. So, I like to brush these off the grill so you don't get your grill too nasty. Kind of just get some fermented honey on there. Finish those up, looking to char the outside a little bit. 
then these, uh, these lime suprems, we have uh, just poached for about five minutes in a basic simple syrup. So we're kind of going to have lime two ways on there. We're going to have the, the pickle and the suprems. All right. Okay. I think I'll just go a couple of those because that guy's a little big. All right. Then some lime pickle here. Julianne. So again, the more different layers of flavor, especially for these, and some of the pickling and fermenting really helps bring in the umami flavors, which is key for plant forward cuisine, obviously, because you're not getting it from uh, the meat. And lentils here, we will just toss in a little vinaigrette. Empty that bowl. And again, you can fry these, which nice texture, but you lose the nutritional benefits from sprouting. So sprouting activates, um, it changes the nutritional composition. Lentils and all legumes, of course, are seeds. So we're basically starting the germination process when we sprout it. All right. And then we will finish up with some pea tendrils. Right there. And, if, and then a couple red sorrel leaves. And there's the dish. If you'd like to try some sprouted lentils or the fermented honey, I'll dress them and kind of just put them out. You can try them afterwards. Um, there you go. Thank you so much, Ethan. And so this yes. would be a, a vegetarian main dish. Is that an first, entree for everyone? First, first course. course, okay. Yeah. And do you find that your customers, um, do they ask for a vegetarian option or, or for a vegetarian first course, or are they just willing to go with whatever you're going with? Yes, by? well, we've definitely seen a ton of people uh, moving that way, especially the last five years. and. We're doing events, so obviously a little different than restaurants, but um, it's, it's every year it's more and more, and especially as more and more guests are vegetarian or vegan. For events, it's great because less need to have alternate options. Yeah. So even if you're running a restaurant and you're doing private events, vegetarian first courses, or I should say plant forward, doesn't have to be vegetarian or vegan necessarily, but they do have the advantage of less need for separate dishes for those people. Also, sometimes it's better from a temperature control standpoint. So, I mean, a ceviche obviously is a little trickier to plate 
than this dish on the August summer when you're in a tent in the middle of a winery somewhere or something. So that's nice. Um, yeah, so Great. definitely, definitely getting a lot of requests for it. Wonderful. Thanks again, Ethan. All right, thanks. The final presenter in this session is one of the world's most wonderful chef, most inspiring chef, and she was uh, voted Latin America's Best Female Chef in 2014, but I purposefully uh, said that before without any gender because that is really the kind of chef that she is, of a caliber of creativity and deliciousness that is achieved by, by very few people. Um, Elena Regadas has a number of restaurants in Mexico City. Um, Rosetta, which is her flagship restaurant, and I hope you all got to buy the book yesterday, um, the cookbook, which just came out, um, is a really magical scene. A, a big part of the dining room is actually in an open courtyard, so you're eating this wonderful produce-centric food um, that is um, also not... It's Mexican ingredients, but it's not necessarily that you're eating a traditional Mexican dish. Uh, very uh, ingredient-driven, very driven by Elena's creativity herself in this very, very special place. Um, and then um, her panaderias are the kind of places where people line up long into the morning for coffees, for rolls. Gua her guava roll is a wonderful specialty. So um, you now, if you've never been to Mexico City, you can be among the many Americans who go and eat the wonderful food in Mexico City. Um, and I really, really urge you to go and eat Elena's food at Rosetta. And please join me in welcoming Elena Regadas. Thank you, Anne, for the invitation and for the introduction. And thank you for all of you being here and listening to, to our ideas and our dreams and what we do every day. Um, I am Mexican. I, I live in Mexico since I, since I was born, but I have the opportunity to live abroad for some years. And I realized when I was abroad how lucky we are as chefs to be in Mexico, that it's really a wonderful place in terms of biodiversity, especially in herbs, in plants, in fruits. And um, when Anne told me the theme of, of this uh, talk, it was really like a big challenge to think how can we cost um, plant-based foods. So, well, uh, what I would try to, to say today is that we all know that we have different types of, of vegetables in this world. The first is the agro-industrial vegetables that unfortunately is what we have more and more and it's what, you know, I have a a couple of pictures showing how this is the type of vegetables that we, most of the people, and we as chefs try to, of course, not use, but this is the more ready available vegetables. But fortunately, there's the other part of the vegetables that have um, been growing by small producers. And as Joaquin, I share the love of vegetables, but also I share uh, Yolkan as a, my main vegetable uh, providor. And what is amazing of working with Yolkan, being in Mexico City, is that the chinampas are in Xochimilco, which is in the south part of Mexico City. So it's within the city. And although it's within the city, it would feel like if it was uh, in a rural area because in this, what used to be Xochimilco, that it was a big lake, um, after the Spaniards came to Mexico, it started to be reduced and reduced, but still we have a small part of it. And Chinampas are islands, small islands made by man, where uh, the crops are, um, uh, where the crops are there. And what is amazing of the chinampas for me, it's this what you see in the picture, which is the soil of the water canals, that with this soil, the plants are um, being harvested. So this soil brings not only lots of flavor and lots of nutritious, but really uh, I feel it brings other type of flavor into the vegetables. 
and it's completely sustainable because the the seeds are you know deep into one of each of these like if you can see like this small it's like a rectangle where there's a perfect um, rectangular small cubes and there the seed is uh, planted in one of these so there's no plastic and there's not a single um, way thing that will affect the ecosystem so it also it's amazing for the people that work in the chinampas because they are from Xochimilco and this is really an ancient knowledge and knowledge that comes since the Aztecs so it really gives pride to the people living there and it's really an amazing project and as I told you as Joaquin I, I uh, source most of my vegetables from there um, and I'm going now to pass to what I thought was a good way to show how uh, food plant uh, dishes can be um, cost and I thought a lot about it and what I came was uh, that I could do a parallelism with uh, contemporary art and in that sense um, I would um, um, I am thinking the words that an Italian thinker from the 70s uh, Franco Bifo said about how, although usually costing is related to uh, the labor and the, the, the measure by the labor time required to produce it. You know, this is what Marx said, and this is what in this last century we have been costing things. And in restaurants, it's how we cost dishes usually. We take into consideration what costs, to, to get the ingredients and what costs in time. And this is how we usually cost plates. However, when it comes to vegetables, when you cost it, in this sense, usually it is very, very low and it's difficult to, to really give the value to plant-based uh, dishes. And I like these um, words of, of uh, Franco Bifo because I agree with him that th certain things can't be measured in this sense. Certain things like uh, War and Peace, uh, like the, this beautiful book by, by Tolstoy, or contemporary art, or art in general cannot be uh, measured or valued in this sense as Marx said. And um, for me, it's a very amazing example how uh, Marcel Duchamp in 1917, which, you know, it's one century ago, uh, showed this um, fountain in this uh, Parisian exhibition, and it was completely um, pol polemic, and many people hated this. But this guy uh, ended selling this fountain in... Uh, 1.7 million dollars so of course the cost of this fountain is not that the value it's other thing it's what Duchamp thought it's what um, he connected with and it's just his idea what values this is not the object itself and other examples in contemporary art is for example this um, half filled a um, glass of water from Cuban artist Wilfredo Prieto that he sold it in $20,000 and you know in contemporary art it works like this of course for food it's difficult to think like this but I just thought it was a good idea to example that costing it's you know more the value of the ideas and not necessarily the the exact pricing. Other example that I love in contemporary art is these uh, cans uh, of, uh, of beans. This is from Mexican artist Gabriel Orozco, which is a, um, uh, I don't know, it's just a piece he recently uh, showed and he tried to 
to um, replicate a convenience store, OXO store. And what he did is that in all the products of a convenience store that he replicated inside a gallery in Mexico City, he added these stamps. And these stamps, it's now part of his brand. Everybody, well, not everybody, but in the art world, people know that this resembles Gabriel Orozco. So when he put uh, these stickers into the produce of the, of the convenience store, the prices, you know, from a can of beans that value half a dollar, they ended uh, selling them in $15,000, uh, I mean. So of course, it's easy to, um, to show in these examples how the value is something else. And in this sense, I feel food can also, especially plant-based food, could be value in another sense and not just in the materiality of the ingredients. So, well, this was a, just an idea that I wanted to share with you. And now I'm going to show you a, a dish that we do in Rosetta, which is my main restaurant in Mexico City, in Colonia Roma. It's a white mole. It's a mole that um, has been very popular. And it's a mole that it's usually done in weddings. And it's why it's called white. It was, it's it's um, dedicated to the bride. And here in the white mole, what we use, it's more like a white or more in the light side ingredients than in the usual or more common uh, black mole. This mole, it comes from Guerrero, and it's sad, but it's used, it's done less and less. Um, because now the more popular moles come from Oaxaca, but this is another type of mole that we love. But usually, of course, mole, it's served with animal protein, but I love to serve moles just with vegetables, because I feel the sauce itself, the mole itself, it's very a complex uh, dish. And the idea here is to show how a dish full of vegetables and uh, nuts, it has lots of nutrients and it's delicious and it doesn't want to resemble uh, animal protein dish. It doesn't want to resemble meat. It doesn't want to, to have the, the, the flavor of meat. It really wants to show how vegetables are delicious and very beautiful and um, related to the land where they come from. For example, chilies in Europe, uh, they are not uh, hot. So chilies in Mexico have that smokiness and that spiciness because of the land where they grow. And other uh, herbs, for example, like hoja santa, that is one of the herbs, well, the only herb we're going to use for this mole, it only grows in certain parts in, of Mexico and another few parts of the world. So for me, it's much more interesting to work and to cook with vegetables and with herbs and with fruits than with uh, animal protein. Well, um, now I'm going to show you how we do this mole. Um, we will start with the longest part that, of course, takes longer, but we will um, start with that. So this is something we added in the restaurant, which was the cauliflower. Usually this mole doesn't have cauliflower, but we just thought it was better to add the cauliflower because the mole with the fruit, that is the, the main recipe, with the apple and the plantain, it's a bit too sweet for us. So we added the cauliflower and it gives not only um, a less sweet flavor, but also it makes the mole more, like more spongy. So that's why we added the cauliflower and it was very nice to do that. The plantain, it's important to have it very, very ripe. So it brings all the sweetness. Like this ripe, it's beautiful. 
Look at um. Yeah. Plantain is used a lot in in moles. Some some people don't even like to use chocolate, and they use only plantain. Is it milk that you're cooking all of this in? The is first, it, the liquid that you put I'm in. I'm sorry. The liquid is milk. Okay. It's cow's milk. But I was thinking today that now I can maybe try to use almond milk because it's full of nuts. So maybe that would be something that now we will try. This is sultanas. So yes, in order to make it completely vegan, it's easy to do a mole vegan. And. Um, this is a bit of habanero, which I remove the seeds. And the idea is just to infuse. So once the vegetables and the fruit is cooked, we are going to remove the, the chili away. This is usually what we do in, our, in, in my restaurant, because although I like spicy, I don't like too spicy. So usually with chilies, we just um, infuse them. We remove them. In, you know, in general. Um, we also, the spices will be only to inf for infusion. So what we do, like now we have this beautiful cheesecloth, but sometimes in, in, in rural areas they use, for example, Loja Santa to do like a small sachet in order to keep the little, you know, the spices inside. So. This is what we do with the cinnamon. We just do like a small. Because we also will remove this once the vegetables are cooked. So while this cooks, we're going to Just give a slight toast to all the, the spices, which are fennel seeds, cilantro seeds, um, cloves, star anise, and peppercorn. And then we are going to use this um, cheesecloth. And uh, what takes more, like, um, um, care in this, in the moles, is usually the toasting of the of the seeds. We use butter, but you can try with uh, with oil. I'm going to try as soon as I go to Mexico. Or what we use sometimes instead of butter is coconut uh, coconut oil. And that really, really works. Are you trying to make dishes more vegan or? Am I trying to? Are you trying to make your dishes more vegan? It sounds like you're thinking through some strategies and. Yes, yes. We try more and more to, to go through that because I like it. And then, you know, many people and many customers <coughs> are more conscious about their diet and their health. And they try to avoid lard, fat, uh, well, animal fat, and milk, and uh, gluten, and all these things. Mm -hmm. Which for me, it's, it's good because it really um, makes us more creative as chefs. And then it's amazing how you end up with things that you didn't think you could do after trying that. So. We're happy always to go through that. So these are the spices that we are going to add to the, to the milk, just to infuse so we can remove that once it's cooked. Just a bit of water as well. So here is the, um, we're going to basically uh, cook the 
the onion and the garlic in some butter. I always like to add a bit of oil with the butter so it doesn't burn that easily. And for me, this mole, like, it's a beautiful plate in the sense that um, it not only reminds me that mole is a dish that it's done for festivities, and usually it's done uh, with many or a few women cooking together. Some do the grinding of the chilies and the seeds, some do the cleaning, and it's really a, 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 one of the dishes that, that show how in Mexico, in the countryside, especially in the rural areas, food is about cooking in a communal way. Cooking in a communal way and also eating always a, in a sense of a sharing and it's very important. You wouldn't do a mole just for yourself. It always it's planned to be done for for the others, for for a festive and for a really with like something with joy. So for me, it's that's important because we more and more tend to be by ourselves and in a very individualistic uh, way of, um, of living. So I, you know, mole reminds me of that. And also mole reminds me of the diversity we have in Mexico, like all these spices, all these nuts, all the chilies. It's really a, a dish that reminds me that. And it's just, um, it's a dish that also, for example, reminds me, because now we're going to go through what's on top of the mole, which are the carrots, which... Uh, and, and through the magic of TV, we may have to go straight to, the, to plating the finished version, because we only have um, about a minute left. Yes, of course. So we did this in advance, which are uh, charcoal, like carrots cooked in charcoal. So we need to keep them al dente, but we just cook them in the hot coals so they burn in the outside. And that's, you know, to, to remember how, um, where mole is done usually, the, wom the women cook in, in coals and in open fires. And also we do some carrots that we cook them in salt. So we slightly ferment them. And it's also to remember and to remind us how precious salt is and how beautiful it helps to cook and give another flavor to, to carrots. So with the onion here, we just um, make it sweat. And when the aromas start to, start to release, we add the, the almonds. So we cook that a little while, and, in, and after we, we will add the pine nuts and the sunflower seeds. So while this, while this cooks, what we do with the carrots is, after we cook them, these ones in salt, and these ones in the coals, we do like uh, ribbons. So basically, We do these ribbons that not only gives texture to the dish and, and flavor, but also we always try to use different color of carrots. Ay. <laughs> to show how carrots 
don't come all in the same size or the same color. And it's amazing, still people, many people think carrots are only orange. We'll have to play the final dish, Elena. Excuse me? You'll, ha you'll have to play to the final dish now. So it's lunchtime. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I need to hurry up. Okay, well, and this is, is a... easy. This is the last part. So you cook a little bit more the, the nuts. And then while this should be cooked, well, in a couple more minutes, what we do is that we take away the, the sachet, the... Um, cinnamon and the chilies. We blend these nice and smooth and the nuts we just uh, don't blend them completely. We, we want to keep the texture. And then we mix both of these and we end like with this type of, uh, of texture. That. And then one last thing that it gives the dish a very nice uh, extra, it's what we do with the coals. The coals where the carrots were cooked, we, once it's very um, red and, and very hot, we mix it with uh, grapeseed oil. So we end up with this black, dark charcoal oil, which gives a lot of uh, flavor and color and um, Reminds us of these coals where it's where the people cook outside of the city. So you will have a chance to try it because we will have that for lunch. This is delicious and also it's supposed to be very good for your stomach. Do you price your vegetable, your plant forward or plant based dishes the same as your animal protein dishes? Um, Tell me that again, please. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering in terms of, throughout this session, one question that I was having is, um, is some of the problem self-created in terms of, we tend to price vegetable dishes less, right? So okay. there's also that in terms of not, not giving c customers the idea that the value is similar. So if we price them the same as a meat dish, that, that also, there's a psychology there. So I was wondering um, if there is a big difference on your menu in terms of pricing. Well, yes, of course, vegetables are always uh, less costly. However, they uh, we always tend to um, elevate and, and, and get higher the the plants, the plant, this type of dishes. For example, this one it's twelve dollars and it's a starter. Okay, great. So we try not to make a big difference. So this is basically the. De mole. Wonderful.
Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Joaquin. We unfortunately don't have time for full session questions, but since all of our presenters are here, if you have questions for them, please come down. Otherwise, you can go up through the top uh, for lunch where you will be eating the mole and other delicious things that have been prepared. And we will see you back here at 1.30. Thank you. Hi, I'm here to talk about senior living and health care, a very important segment. Using Rich's products, operators are able to offer a variety of customizable meals, higher quality food, and provide impressive selections. Snacks are also very important to seniors. So we have a breadstick that you can make out of our Rich's pizza dough. We also have a Rich's parfait made with layers of our Rich's on top, applesauce, and our crumbled uh, Uber, which we call the ultimate breakfast round or some granola round. Also, using our six by six Rich's flatbread, you can make a caprese sandwich which is very, very appealing and tasty. You can also cut this into triangles for a shareable application. Then we also want to talk about the Rich's plant-based cooking cream. This is one of our newest products. It does not contain any of the eight allergens. It can make a vegan tomato soup. You start with a little bit of oil and sweat your vegetables till they're tender. Then you add a slurry, some vegetable broth, some crushed tomatoes and thicken that up and then you come back and finish it with the plant-based cooking cream for a creamy vegan tomato soup which goes great with breadsticks and our sandwiches. Using Rich's products you can cater to that dinner party generation and provide impressive selections. Hi, Chef Jake here from Rich's. I'm here to talk to you today about our new ready to stretch pizza dough. It's unique, authentic, versatile, and flexible. It gives you the opportunity to make beautiful artisan style pizzas by taking dough right from the refrigerator onto the screen, stretch it to the thickness you want, and then top it and bake it in whatever oven you have. We have six inch or 12 inch dough you may buy pizza dough already from Rich's and you say, well, what makes this different? What makes it different is it's ready to stretch right from the fridge. It's authentic, it's unique, and it's ready to stretch to give you that artisan pizza dough that you've been looking for for your operation for years. So let's stretch a pizza. We'll use our, our six inch, six ounce, ready to stretch pizza dough we took right from the refrigerator. This eliminates proofing so it makes it easier for the operator to use. I'll stretch our dough without even picking it up. And you can make this as thick or thin as you want. I'll, stre I'll stretch this six inch dough to about 12 inches. And even if it's not perfectly round, it gives it that rustic artisan look. So today we're gonna prepare a margarita pizza. I'll take our ready to stretch pizza dough, use a, a small amount of pizza sauce, spread it evenly, and then add our ingredients. I have sliced tomato, fresh mozzarella cheese, and we'll get this right in the oven and bake this. We're gonna bake this at a high temperature and we'll see how nice it comes out of, out of the oven. Whether you have a, an impinger oven, whether you have a convection oven, or a wood stone oven, the pizza bakes up perfectly every time. So let's get to the oven. So here's our pizza straight out of the oven. We'll add our basil. And we'll cut it up for our customers to enjoy. We have to remember with this pizza crust, the texture is that of real scratch dough without making it from scratch. And I think your guests are gonna love it. So there we have it, an artisan pizza made with our 
Rich's Ready to Stretch Pizza Dough. Remember, no proofing, and we get that airy artisan texture with a nice crunchy crust. And I think you're gonna love it. So I invite you to take our new Ready to Stretch Pizza Dough, serve it to your customers, and see what great reaction you have. Hey, thanks for joining me in my kitchen today. I hope to see you again real soon. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about a very competitive segment, college and universities. College students are clamoring for plant-based products, and Rich's has a new broccoli and cheese pizza crust and a cauliflower crust. Lots of options you can do with these plant-based crusts. You can, of course, do a pizza, but it makes a great panini, a gluten-free panini. You can also use it as a salad bowl for salads. You can also use it as a gluten-free crust for quiche. You can also do crackers, breadsticks, and gluten-free croutons for salads. The product comes in frozen. It is fully baked. All you need to do is thaw it under refrigeration and see how pliable it is. So you can actually fold it and make paninis out of it. It has a wonderful flavor. In fact, it's college student approved. Here is a dish with spiralized sweet potatoes, clams, and a creamy Asian turmeric sauce. Using a spiralizer, spiralize the sweet potatoes into long, thick noodles. Cook the sweet potatoes in boiling water, stirring gently for about a minute or two. Drain and set aside. Heat the vegetable oil in a wok over medium-low heat. Add the sweet potato noodles. Stir frequently and cook just until tender. Remove from the wok and set aside. In the same wok, add a little oil, add the clams, turn the heat to medium, add the garlic, ginger, and chopped chili pepper. Add coconut milk and no professional liquid concentrate base. Add turmeric and fresh lime juice. Cook until the clams are open, remove, and then set aside. Reduce the broth until it's thick enough to coat a spoon and season to taste. Add the noodles back into the sauce, toss gently, and then add the clams to combine well. Place the noodles and the clams on a plate, sprinkle with furikake, cilantro, and sprouts. Garnish with lime. So here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a recipe for beet tartare with a quick cured egg, a modern take on an old classic. Combine the fish sauce, Worcestershire sauce, oyster sauce, honey, hot sauce, garlic cloves, and ground mustard. Gently place the yolks in the marinade. Cover and marinate in the refrigerator for 12 to 24 hours. These beets have been roasted, peeled, and diced. Combine the beets with the mayonnaise, Tabasco sauce, cornichons, capers, and scallions, and toss gently to combine. Season to taste and hold refrigerated. Add a small amount of oil to a cast iron pan. Cut the peeled shallots in half and sear flat side down until they begin to caramelize. Set aside. To plate, use a round cutter to form the beet tartare. Place an egg yolk in the middle. Garnish with brulee shallots, radishes, asparagus spears, dill tops, and microgreens. Finish with dots of Hellman's Real Mayonnaise. Here's our beet tartare with quick cured egg. Enjoy. This is a great dish of pressure caramelized carrots with za'atar mayo, candied sunflower seeds, and roasted parsley and carrot top gremoulade. Combine the peeled trimmed carrots with the butter, the baking soda, and a little bit of salt in a pressure cooker. 
Set the pressure cooker on high pressure for 15 minutes. In the meantime, prepare the gremulata. Fry the carrot top and parsley leaves in canola oil until translucent and crisp, about 15 seconds. Drain on paper towel and sprinkle with salt. Gently toss the fried leaves with lemon zest and set aside. To prepare the za'atar mayo, combine the mayonnaise with za'atar and freshly squeezed lemon juice. Place in a squeeze bottle and refrigerate until ready to use. To prepare the candied sunflower seeds, heat the seeds in a small nonstick pan for about three minutes. Stir in the brown sugar, stirring constantly over medium heat until seeds are coated and the brown sugar has melted. Place on wax paper, sprinkle with salt, and let cool. To serve, place the warm carrots on a plate, drizzle with a za'atar mayo, top with candied seeds and gremulata. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a light, refreshing dish featuring sustainable seafood. Alaskan black cod with a grapefruit relish and an avocado cream. In a bowl, whisk together the grapefruit juice, soy sauce, mirin, miso paste, and black pepper. Marinate the cod fillets for up to 30 minutes. For the relish, char the jalapeno over an open flame. Once cooled, seed and mince. Combine with the diced grapefruit segments, scallions, sugar, red wine vinegar, and olive oil. Season to taste and refrigerate until ready to use. To make the avocado cream, combine the avocado, garlic, yogurt, Hellman's light mayonnaise, chili, and lime juice in a blender. Blend until smooth. Heat oil in a nonstick saute pan over medium heat. Pan sear the cod until opaque and beginning to caramelize. To serve, place the avocado cream on the bottom of the plate. Top with the fish and the grapefruit relish. Garnish with microgreens. Here's our finished dish. I hope you enjoy. This dish is a fun take on a classic gratiné, hollandaise crusted cauliflower, seasoned with cheese and mustards. Cut the cauliflower into florets, then toss the florets in a mixing bowl with oil, hot sauce, thyme, garlic, salt, and pepper. Place on a sheet pan lined with parchment paper and roast at a 425 degree oven until the florets begin to turn golden brown about 15 to 20 minutes. Remove and set aside. Meanwhile, combine the panko, parsley, lemon zest, and cheeses, then season with the salt and pepper. Combine the Nor liquid hollandaise sauce with the grainy and Dijon mustards. Place the roasted cauliflower in a preheated cast iron pan, top with the hollandaise sauce, and sprinkle with the breadcrumb mixture. Roast for another 10 minutes or until the breadcrumbs are golden brown. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy.